Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Valerie, for this uh, introduction and uh, good morning, <clears throat> good afternoon or good evening, everyone attending the webinar. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure. It's a real pleasure for me to be part of these discussions. And uh, this, uh, this topic is really, is really of high interest. And when disaster strikes home, uh, making the most of local uh, culture and knowledge in a crisis. Um, so I would like to contribute to this theme uh, by taking primarily a humanitarian perspective. As Valerie was mentioned, uh, I am a humanitarian at heart, and even in my current engagement with NATO, I'm still a humanitarian advisor. And so I would like to, uh, to take this angle to the discussion and uh, looking uh, at uh, how we can really make the most of local knowledge and the local communities uh, when we look at uh, the humanitarian environment, uh, looking at uh, preparedness response efforts, uh, primarily uh, when uh, responding to natural hazards. So quite a different perspective from Professor Sanma, but I hope still, uh, still interesting uh, and, um, and in tune uh, with, uh, with the debate uh, and, and the theme of the webinar. So I would like to start by looking at uh, uh, what we call uh, in, the, in the humanitarian community uh, the localization agenda. Uh, I think um, many of you might be aware that uh, back uh, in uh, 2016, uh, there was the first ever World Humanitarian Summit uh, convened at that time by the then uh, UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon. And the World Humanitarian Summit took place in Istanbul, a very successful event. Uh, uh, bringing together more than 9,000 participants uh, from uh, 180 member states. Uh, there were 55 heads of states and governments and uh, a lot of uh, uh, civil society organization, uh, non-government organization, but also uh, the private sector and then academia. And uh, a lot of the discussion of the, of the World Humanitarian Summit uh, focused uh, on uh, the, what is known as uh, the localization agenda and, and the grand bargain. Um, this was uh, uh, at that time a unique agreement um, between some of the largest donors and uh, the humanitarian organizations who uh, committed to get more means into the hands of people in need and uh, to improve the effectiveness and efficiency uh, of the way that humanitarian assistant, uh, uh, assistance uh, uh, was being delivered. Now we are in 2022, quite uh, a few years forward, uh, and we are already talking about uh, a grand bargain 2.0, where we have the same strategic objectives of uh, uh, achieving uh, um, better humanitarian outcomes for affected populations, primarily uh, supporting the leadership, the delivery and the capacity of local, of local responders, and of course, uh, including uh, uh, the participation of affected communities. Um, so um, the, um, the localization debate and the grand bargain is still very lively uh, today. And I will get back uh, a little bit towards uh, uh, the end of this webinar to where we stand around uh, the debate also from a policy point of view. But now for this webinar, we'd like to focus a little bit more on a pragmatic and operational approach and looking at how this localization agenda is concretely uh, being implemented uh, um, in uh, preparedness and response work uh, in a specific region. And this region is, uh, uh, is Asia and the Pacific. So I chose uh, Asia Pacific because as Valerie was mentioned, I spent uh, a big deal of my professional life. Uh, um, yes, Valerie, you have a question? I cannot hear you. Sorry, there's just a raised hand sign. I'm not sure where it's from. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so carry on, please. Okay, sorry. So I chose Asia Pacific because as Valerie was mentioned, this is where I spent uh, a great deal of my uh, professional humanitarian work, but also because I would like to focus more on crisis uh, linked to natural hazards. And uh, Asia Pacific uh, uh, is, we call it uh, in uh, lay terms, uh, the 7-Eleven of natural hazards. But uh, more uh, officially, um, over the last uh, 50 years, uh, almost 7 billion people have been affected by natural hazards in Asia Pacific. Almost 2 million people were the victim of climate-related events, uh, primarily water-related events, 
so floods, uh, storms, and and um, tropical cyclones. And therefore, I think it's no surprise that uh, um, uh, an organization like the UNSCAP, which is the Economic and Social Council of Asia Pacific, in their uh, report last year, have forecasted that uh, between 2020 and 2030, 40% of global economic losses from natural disasters will occur uh, in the Asia Pacific region. So I think the Asia Pacific has been the perfect testbed, if you want, of this localization agenda and how to integrate uh, local knowledge and local communities uh, in uh, uh, preparedness and response efforts. And starting, uh, starting with the preparedness efforts, um, very much in Asia Pacific, uh, the humanitarian community states that every preparedness and response must be as local as possible and as international as necessary. Now, the, the, the difficult thing is how, how to make this happen. So looking at preparedness work, uh, uh, humanitarian actors, and here I also must pay credit uh, to OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, uh, an agency, a UN agency that in Asia Pacific has been leading, has been at the forefront of this discussion. When we look at preparedness efforts, uh, in Asia Pacific, really, um, the, the starting point are the local communities understanding uh, what uh, would be the resilience, uh, the coping capacity uh, of communities themselves, understanding against given scenario, what would be within their capacity, within their means and capabilities to respond. And uh, in case of large scale, uh, uh, let's say events, uh, what additional support, if anything, would need to be provided by the, the broader uh, international community. So looking really at this uh, uh, understanding of the local communities, uh, um, the humanitarian community uses uh, uh, a number of tools. Uh, one of the tools is a look at the secondary data, looking at uh, reports of, uh, let's say, past crisis in the region, um, having, uh, let's say, an analysis and research on what uh, have been um, historically uh, people's needs. And a lot of this research uh, is done, uh, as I mentioned, uh, through secondary data, looking at reports uh, produced by also by local uh, and national organizations, but also this understanding of uh, local capacities and local needs is done by engaging with communities themselves. So through uh, an important effort of communicating with uh, affected communities. Um, so here I just showed you an example of, uh, let's say, the results of a questionnaire that was uh, um, shared with uh, communities in Myanmar where the, uh, the humanitarian um, workers wanted to understand from communities themselves um, what would have been the key media needs that the communities would have required uh, in a given scenario in the first few weeks uh, of, uh, of the response efforts uh, in terms of uh, the key sectors of response, so food, water and sanitation and hygiene, health and shelter, but also how, how these communities would have wanted this uh, assistance to be delivered, whether they want an in-kind assistance of maybe a more, let's say, a technological oriented solution such as cash transfers or cash vouchers. Um, and this is a kind of a community engagement uh, that is conducted in preparedness and that is, uh, is, um, has taken place uh, throughout uh, Southeast Asia, but also to, to some extent also uh, South, South Asia. So by uh, looking at historical data and community, direct community engagement, as I was mentioning, it is possible for humanitarian actors uh, in Asia Pacific to derive this picture of the key media needs. As I mentioned, uh, concrete uh, um, key asks uh, that the communities uh, or key needs the communities might have in the first, uh, let's say, four to four weeks uh, of, a, of a response given a, a, given a, a, a specific scenario. So this is for preparedness, preparedness efforts and uh, community engagement. How do we use uh, this knowledge then in the response, uh, in response efforts? Again, uh, when, it, when it comes to responding uh, to um, climate-related events in Asia-Pacific, uh, 
Um, it's about uh, having an analysis of these key media needs uh, and again looking at what communities themselves uh, would be in the position uh, to use uh, to respond to these key media needs. And so also in the response phase, there is the recognition that communities themselves will be the first responders and will have uh, a certain degree of coping capacity to meet those identified uh, uh, key media needs. Uh, there is also the understanding that uh, these communities uh, will be supported by, let's say, local actors, uh, civil societies, community-based organizations, and uh, also by national level actors um, and national authorities in Asia Pacific. Um, disaster management authorities uh, have um, a, a very strong framework for disaster preparedness and response uh, that they have developed uh, given the, um, the tendency of Asia Pacific to be exposed to natural hazards. So national governments uh, have uh, established a very strong, uh, I would say, humanitarian contract with their communities and are in a very good position uh, to provide uh, uh, support uh, to uh, local communities and local actors. Now, in a given scenario, as we often have in Asia Pacific, uh, of uh, emergencies that exceed really uh, the capacities of communities or local actors or even national actors, then of course uh, you would have um, uh, the um, support of other kind of responders that maybe come from the regional level. Uh, definitely Asia Pacific has uh, quite uh, important and strong regional organizations and they also have a very good understanding of uh, um, regional and local practices uh, in preparing and responding uh, to disaster and could quickly mobilize support uh, to the more national and local level. Finally, uh, as a last resort, really the international level, the international community stepping in only if necessary with the key objectives of uh, increasing uh, the speed and the volume of the response uh, uh, really only for large scale uh, uh, crisis. And again, to give you a concrete example of uh, uh, how these uh, were played out in the uh, in South Asia in the context of Nepal, um, uh, Nepal being, uh, uh, let's say, a landlocked country prone to earthquakes, had been preparing for several years for a earthquake that then occurred back in 2015. In the preparedness phase, uh, uh, they had engaged with local communities, uh, also looking at the different uh, ethnic communities within Nepal to prepare the list of the key media needs uh, that communities would need uh, in the aftermath of, uh, uh, of a earthquake. And when the earthquake happened in 2015, uh, that list of key media needs uh, was actually used. Uh, you can see here a simple timeline, a simple infographic produced by OCHA, especially as I was mentioning the first uh, four weeks of the response uh, to ensure that communities uh, would have aid that would be relevant for them and primarily delivered through local uh, and national humanitarian organizations. And I will go back to Nepal uh, with a short video at the end of this briefing uh, and also to, to reconnect to the fact that um, although I haven't focused a lot on this in my presentation, uh, the Nepal earthquake also uh, was uh, an event that uh, severely impacted the cultural heritage in, of Nepal and of course uh, the, the knowledge of the local communities in, uh, in rebuilding and restoring that cultural her heritage was really, was really fundamental. So um, moving on then to the, to the last part of this briefing, uh, we looked at uh, the in involvement of the communities in preparedness, how uh, communities uh, are uh, considered to be the first responders and the other layers of a response, uh, the regional, international only stepping in if necessary and to increase uh, the speed and the volume of the response. And my last part, the last part of my speech uh, talks about uh, the responsibility that we all have in the end uh, to the affected people and that uh, engaging uh, uh, local communities and the local knowledge really help us to become uh, more ac accountable to the people that we are supposed uh, to serve. And I want to make reference to uh, Dr. Hugo Slim uh, at this point. Uh, Dr. Hugo Slim is a, 
is a consumed humanitarian and uh, um, also researcher of humanitarian affairs. He recently published a very interesting book called Solferino 21, where he looks uh, back at the Battle of Solferino back in the 19th century and looking at the way the humanitarian system has evol evolved ever since. And he really argues that uh, maybe the perfect, uh, the perfect, uh, um, let's say, uh, humanitarian preparedness and response efforts require uh, a creative mix of local, national and international resources. So in his book, he really talks about the need to strengthen uh, really humanitarian cooperation. And uh, he also um, makes reference to the fact that uh, maybe uh, what you, international humanitarians should do to really implement the localization agenda, as I was mentioning in the beginning, is to act uh, as enablers, as facilitators for uh, local communities, for local level organization to really to provide uh, aid that is relevant and aligned with uh, communities, uh, cultures uh, and, and needs. So he actually looks at uh, the humanitarian system, like again, putting people and communities at the center and then all the other layers having to be really closely interconnected with the one becoming more relevant according to the context, according to the scale uh, of the crisis and really where partnership uh, among these different layers isn't only a label that we sometimes put uh, on uh, uh, humanitarian efforts, but it, it is really um, the joining uh, of resources and uh, efforts among the different layers. And to conclude this speech, I would like to show you a video on uh, um, the Nepal earthquake, again, uh, where I think uh, uh, there was a very successful uh, um, balance between this local knowledge of the uh, ethnic communities in Nepal and uh, uh, the, let's say, the regional international level that uh, in the context of the earthquake uh, had to intervene uh, given the scale, uh, the scale uh, of, the, of the crisis. So the video, it's uh, just a couple of minutes, uh, shows uh, an operation um, uh, that uh, uh, the World Food Program, a UN agency, um, had established to reach um, mountain areas where people were in need of humanitarian assistance and in order to do so uh, they worked uh, with uh, uh, with the local communities uh, with uh, uh, specific ethnic communities uh, of uh, these mountain areas that only those communities had uh, the uh, capacity to uh, inform and advise an international organization like WFP on how to reach uh, the people in need. So I'll, I'll show you, I'll show the video and please uh, give me a sign in case uh, you cannot hear the sound or anything goes wrong. Thank you. We would stop on one side of the landslide with the local villagers waiting for the rocks to come by. And as soon as it looked like there was a, uh, a period where it was safe enough, you would run from one side of the landslide to the other. And this is still what's happening. It's getting worse with every aftershock and it's getting worse with every monsoon rain. It is still crazy dynamic, still extremely dangerous out here. And this is what people are facing every day. This is why remote access operation exists. The, the entire corridor has been decimated and completely blocked by landslides. So normally it would take two days to get to this town of Jagat from Sotikola on mules to bring supplies in, but because it's completely blocked, now, as I understand it, from the WFP hub in Abu Karani, it takes one day all the way on tractors to get to Darapani, three days over the 5,000 meter Larky Pass in the Sando, another three days on mules to get to Bihi, and then two more days to get to Jagat, which means what normally could be done in two days is now this nine day circuitous route that goes all the way over this 5,000 meter pass to reach all the communities in this area and it is the only way to reach this area right now. We have been working on the Larky Pass for three weeks now to get it open and we're super excited because tomorrow we will have the first shipment of mules going over with supplies to the areas in the north. So the villages over at the other side, they are very remote and they uh, have no road access at all and uh, they normally have a thousand mules uh, supplying them every day. 
And these routes are now cut off by landslides. We have had people up working at the pass for many days in high altitude. The pass is 5,100 meters, so there's been a lot of work up there. We have to uh, move rocks with uh, too much snow. This is more snow than it has been in many years. With this operation, we hope to uh, supply 20,000 households with rice and oil so we can get them through the monsoon. We have just crossed the Larky Pass with our first amount of supplies and we will continue sending mule trains over the pass until the 65 tons of supplies has been distributed to the villages in the valley below. So yeah, as I mentioned, just uh, a short um, a short example of really local knowledge, local tradition, working together with uh, let's say more the international level, international level organization to build up an operation that would have been unthinkable, <laughs> unthinkable without uh, the the role, the primary role of the local communities. So this uh, this concludes my uh, my speech, my intervention, and. Um, very happy to have a discussion or receive questions. Right, well, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Viviana. Uh, we have uh, some questions for you. <laughs> we have some questions from Nimalka. Um, the first question is, what is the relationship between the hashtag race shape aid and hashtag shape the power movement? Is there a relationship between those two? The hashtag reshape hate and the second? Uh, hashtag sh shift the power. Okay, these were two hashtags that were part of the, let's say, World Humanitarian Summit event where the reshape hate and shift the power meant were connected to what I was describing as the uh, localization agenda. Um, meaning um, uh, putting more aid, more resources uh, uh, into the hands uh, of people and uh, empowering more local and, uh, and national uh, level organizations. So there was uh, especially at, around the World Humanitarian Summit, 
these, um, let's say, big efforts uh, to rethink uh, again. I mean, although you could argue uh, it was already been it was already under discussion even before the World Humanitarian Summit, but taking the opportunity of a, a World Summit being convened to really shift the power balance from the big, let's say, international Western-based humanitarian system to uh, more uh, locally uh, national-led uh, um, preparedness and response efforts with also very clear commitments. For example, uh, there was, as I was mentioning, this grand bargain with the donors who uh, committed uh, putting at least 25% of all their funding uh, entirely to um, uh, national and local, uh, local level organization. So that's, that's where the hashtag were. So it was a, a, at the moment a powerful, uh, let's say, um, a push towards uh, uh, even more reshape aid and shift the power from um, you could argue big Western-based international organization to uh, locally led uh, um, act, uh, organizations and actors. Mm -hmm. And the second question uh, follows on from that. Um, where do you see the reluctance to mobilize this idea into tangible action? Where is that reluctance coming from? Why isn't it actually happening? Okay, on the one hand, uh, and I go back to reluctance, on the one hand, there's also uh, the, the need to, to change a little bit some of the mechanisms uh, that, um, uh, let's say, uh, direct at the moment the, the way the humanitarian assistance is structured. Um, so there is a, a global uh, coordination architecture, a global funding mechanism that at the moment uh, are quite uh, complex uh, and sometimes uh, are, it's difficult for um, uh, locally led organizational local actors to be part of these big uh, structures in terms of coordination of funding process. So on the one hand, there is the difficulty uh, of dismantling uh, or streamlining and uh, making some of the processes uh, uh, simpler and easier, uh, so that also, uh, let's say, uh, local uh, organizations, local actors, can be part of the of the of the system. So there is, on the one hand, some difficulties in getting the the system as it as it is evolved over the years a little bit more simplified and streamlined. Number one, and number two, uh, if we want to talk about reluctance. Um, the, there are some arguments, uh, sometimes you have this divide between uh, the localizers, you call them, those that really want to uh, heavily support the localization agenda, and those, uh, let's say, who still express some concerns, uh, specifically in specific context, uh, maybe not so much uh, when you're responding to natural hazards, when you are more in a situation of conflict or complex emergencies, the role of, uh, uh, let's say, local, uh, local actors local humanitarian actors and the, the, the perceived, uh, if not true, the perceived respect that these actors might have of the humanitarian principles of neutrality, uh, impartiality and operational independence. So there, there is in certain context, specifically in complex emergency, uh, the concern that uh, a localized uh, action uh, has uh, maybe not the kind of oversight when it comes to ne neutrality, impartiality, operational independence that some of the more, let's say, international level actors could guarantee. So there's these two aspects. Mm -hmm. Right. And a final question from Nimalka. Um, do you have any thoughts on the incorporation of first aid to cultural heritage activities into the broader humanitarian response framework? And from your experience, where would you see the heritage related needs fit into this field when it comes to post-crisis recovery? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And as I was uh, making reference, for example, to the Nepal case studies, although I didn't specific focus on that, the, the, the cultural heritage was part and parcel of the discussions uh, both in the pre with the local communities, both in the preparedness and uh, in the response efforts. What, uh, let's say, cultural heritage uh, is included in uh, is, uh, let's say, the overarching framework of protection, where when we discuss with local communities, not only about uh, 
physical protection of, of people, but also uh, their cultural heritage and uh, both tangible and intangible heritage. So under the protection uh, umbrella and under the protection discussion, then uh, um, protecting uh, cultural sites uh, and, um, uh, and cultural heritage uh, is, is part of uh, um, preparedness and response efforts. And usually, when you have, uh, let's say, uh, humanitarian response plans that are based on this uh, discussion with local communities, there is a dedicated part that looks at uh, protection of cultural sites, protection of cultural heritage within this broader framework of protection. So I see cultural protection of our cultural heritage having the same uh, priority and the same, uh, um, let's say, value in that uh, key media needs discussion that, that you have with the communities. In fact, in the context of Nepal, it was only thanks to the, to the local knowledge and the discussion with the local communities that really support could be provided in uh, rebuilding and restoring uh, the, the cultural sites and heritage that were heavily, heavily damaged especially in the capital in Kathmandu. Uh, so it was only thanks to those discussions that uh, um, an appropriate uh, um, safeguarding and if needed, restoring of the cultural sites could be uh, taken care of.